Good morning, everyone. Uh, well, good morning for me. I'm not sure if it's good morning for you guys, but I uh, just want to thank you all for joining um, the OSS community call. Um, before we get going, just want to make sure that all the audio and things are working. So in the chat box, if you guys don't mind typing in the color toothbrush that I hope you use this morning. Uh, if you can hear me, just type in the color of the toothbrush you use this morning. There are answers coming in. <laughs> we don't need sneaking toothbrushes. Thank you for that answer. That made my morning. Um, perfect. Okay. So good to hear. Um, and then if you guys ha start having any um, any audio issues throughout the call, just type those in the chat box as well, um, and I'll help you guys get those get those handled. But before we get going, and I hand it off to Tim Walton and Ross Gardler, um, just wanted to let you guys know that this call is being recorded, and that you um, and that your information may or may not show up um, at some point in time if you do ask a question or um, if there's a reply all or things of that nature. So if that is something that you guys are concerned about. Um, I suggest that you uh, leave the call now and then listen to the recording that we will have posted to YouTube in the next few days. Um, in addition to that, we will be posting these slides to the OSS Yammer group as well. So uh, please join that community as all of our content, and that's kind of our hub for everything that's open source. Um, but with that, um, that's all I have as the moderator in logistical issues, and I will hand it off to Tim to kick things going. Thanks, Parker, and thanks, everybody, for spending some of your valuable time with us. I'm very excited for you to join our October OSS community call. I'm Tim Walton. I'm a technical solution professional, and I work with the OSS Practice Development Unit. That's basically a team dedicated to helping partners build OSS practices. So uh, we will be joined today with, by Ross Gardler. Uh, he's a principal program manager at Microsoft and president of the Apache Foundation, and we'll be going over containers. So with that, let's kick in. What I wanted to do was just give a quick agenda of what we're going to go over today. First of all, we're going to do a refresher on why um, open source is important to Microsoft where we think we, the focus is going to be on open source, and then how Microsoft can enable you, a partner, to build a successful practice. And then we'll dig into the what, which is going to be focused on Microsoft container strategy. So the why, let's just do a quick refresher on why OSS is important. You've probably all seen this slide, and let me build it out. But essentially, the opportunity on for open source is much bigger than we're traditionally used to at Microsoft. If you look on the left of this slide, you can see our first party services that we traditionally think of, whether it's System Center, OMS, uh, Visual Studio, SQL Server, Windows Server, etc. That's traditionally where Microsoft and its partners focus on. However, when it comes to open source, there is a massive selection of other technologies that you could use to support management, applications, frameworks, and tools, etc. And that is really what the opportunity is. In fact, when you think about OSS, remember that a third of all the VMs are now Linux. 60% of our solutions that are on Azure Marketplace, or over 60%, are open source. So Microsoft needs you partners, SIs, for us to be successful and for our customers to be successful. If you look at this mosaic of logos, um, there is a lot of technology out there. We can't boil all of the open source ocean, so we focus on certain workloads. But what I want you to take away from this and make sure you're aware is it's not just Azure. I want to look at the top of the slide where we say private, hybrid, and public cloud. All of these solutions can be placed in our public cloud or a hybrid solution or on a private cloud. And that's very, very important to articulate that to our customers that they have that choice. So let's focus a little bit on what our workloads that at Microsoft we think are key. So this is what we think of as the where. So think of it as six workloads. And as you look at the slide, and I won't go through all of it, 
you can break it down into three pieces, essentially infrastructure optimization. We all know that our customers have open source solutions in their private data centers or their or in the public cloud. We need to be able to work with those customers on their Linux infrastructure and bring that to Azure, whether that's through disaster recovery or a lift and shift. When it comes to new application development, open source is key for most of our customers, whether it's DevOps through things like Docker, CloudBees, Jenkins, etc., Java enterprise uh, platforms that we can support through Cloud Foundry, etc., or just traditional uh, web-based applications uh, using the LAMP and mean stack. So all of these things we need SIs for. We also need them for data and compute resources. Actually, data infrastructure is probably one of the biggest consumers of Azure that we have out there, and um, and even containers actually plays a part of it. In fact, stepping back, if you think about it, containers actually can hit all of these key workloads. The thing that I want to point out here is we take direction from the open source ecosystem and our partnerships with certain ISVs like Red Hat, Docker, or um, Cloudera, et cetera. So we work through the open source ecosystem to take that direction. So rather than in our traditional first party services where we're moving the, we're given the direction, it's our open source ecosystem that gives us that direction. So these are the, the high value workloads that we think our partners are gonna focus on. The last point I'll make on this is Obviously, we're focused on doing digital transformation of our customers. When you do a digital transformation, again, it's probably going to touch most of these high-value workloads. But the key point is that as a partner, you should be able to articulate which of these high-value workloads you can actually deliver as an offering to our customers. So how does Microsoft help you build that practice? What resources do you have available? So very quickly, I'll go over what those resources are. So I'm with the Practice Development Unit, and with the Practice Development Unit, we're focused on identifying OSS practices. So if you're on this call and you have an OSS practice, you have my email address, please tell me you know, what that practice is and what your offering is. We want to work with you to build out that practice, build a quality practice, and integrate it into the Microsoft and OSS ecosystem. Once we have that quality OSS practice that we've developed with you, we want to then drive joint selling of your partner offering with Microsoft field sellers of which there are hundreds. So it's very important for you as a partner to be able to articulate to me, and therefore I will articulate to the field as well as other resources at Microsoft what your offerings are. We also, through this community, want to ensure that there's successful outcomes, meaning there's a communication channel for you as a partner to give us feedback on what, how we're doing integrating OSS into our platform. We want to help define best practices, and communicate the best support options that you have. The other thing that we're focused on, obviously, is technical readiness, whether that's an on-demand or in-person type training or boot camps. We actually just complete, uh, completed our Cloud Solution Architect boot camp last week. A lot of my partners went there and thought it was a fantastic five-day, 300-level type training. Uh, so we have a lot of training that's out there that's available to you. But really, in summary, it's all about building OSS as a first-class citizen to the Microsoft platform and driving this thriving, valuable, flexible partner ecosystem. So when you think about your practice, it's always important to know that there is certain funding available. And that is important, especially when you begin to sell in the Microsoft ecosystem. Remember as a partner that you're entitled to these funds, and these funds are there to drive your pipeline, drive customer adoption, and ultimately pay you via rewards for consumption that it's driving at the customer, that business value. So I want to give a concrete example. I don't want to drain this slide completely, but I want to give a concrete example of how you could use this funding. For example, if you're a partner that's driving DevOps, and containers is a, is a big part of that, 
if you think about that, you could go to the Visual Studio Everywhere funding, if you have a look at that, on funds for driving ad adoption in the green. That can give you money to do a marketing event to one to many to drive DevOps. From that, you could get several opportunities. You can then further qualify those opportunities using Azure Partner Investment Funding, such as Azure Everywhere. And that's important. So now you've qualified your opportunity, and then you can begin to drive the, the consumption through uh, adoption and proof of concept funding uh, to get that workload driven into the customer and hopefully them getting business value. Once it's in there, you're then going to get rewards back through Digital Partner Record or the Cloud Solution Provider Program that's going to give you money. But the key point I want to make here is this is not a way of making a business, but it is a way that Microsoft wants to help you reduce your cost of sales or cost of goods sold. One of those funding programs that's important to us is the Azure Fast Start for Linux Fundamentals. The key PC I want is it's focused on Linux and open source, and it is a very flexible offering. In fact, we're looking for feedback and content that, to put into this. But think of it as an offering that you can present to your customer, which will be funded on various different levels from Microsoft, where you can educate the customer through a workshop and then do a proof of concept. That proof of concept could be, as I mentioned earlier, uh, maybe the use of Docker and DevOps, et cetera, just to show the customer exactly what they can do and therefore making onboarding um, painless. So if you have any questions, again, you, you have my email on the start of these slides, please reach out to me. Uh, we have many resources available to you, um, you know, just to just to point out a few of these, um, obviously we have training, et cetera. We have our community, which you're uh, participating in today. One of the ones I wanted to point out that um, some of my partners are beginning to use and are finding very, very successful in their building their practices is the profitability and cloud adoption resources. So this is uh, content develop developed by Microsoft and third parties for doing a benchmark assessment of your practice to make sure that you're doing all the known things. And it, it actually does the benchmark on other partner practices as well. So you can see how you look compared to your peers. Uh, but we have many resources. This slide will be available uh, so you can look at those resources that um, will help you. Um, this is a good summary slide on our community. Obviously, you're with the open source solutions community, um, and there are many others. So what I do recommend is most of the partners um, reach out to the other um, technical communities, such as application development or Azure infrastructure and management to sort of build out your Azure or Microsoft platform knowledge. Um, those are listed here, um, and there's various other um, business oriented communities such as ISV Application Builder, which is very important for most partners building IP, which they can reuse. So very quickly, I'll finish up with some OSS news that I thought everybody would uh, be interested in. First of all, Azure Service Fabric Linux support is now in public preview. Uh, so think of Service Fabric as our microservices type solution you can now host that on a Linux OS, um, and you can read more on the blog here, but I think it's very key. And actually, I have multiple partners that are using Service Fabric in some very interesting ways with open source. So if you're doing that, please reach out to me. I'm definitely interested in what uh, partners are doing and, and what they're working with with customers. Another big one I want to announce is the architecting Microsoft Azure solution. So this, if you're looking to get the certification exam 70-534, um, we now have an on-demand EDX course. Uh, it's free, but it'll basically walk you through getting you prepped to take that certifi certification exam. So I strongly recommend it, and you can actually uh, pay to get that certification on the website, and there's a link there. Another thing that I thought was important was the accelerated network for Azure Virtual Machines. Um, we talk about Windows machines here, but I know, for example, talking to Red Hat, they're beginning to look at 
enabling that on their Red Hat distribution of Linux and various other distros are looking to that as well. If you need accelerated networking, say you're doing an open source data platform solution, again, please reach out to me if you have any questions on that. Uh, another big thing is Azure Disk Encryption is now available for Windows and Linux. So uh, encryption at rest uh, using um, our technology and Azure Key Vault to, uh, to enable that um, encryption at rest. And finally, we did some improvements with our Azure App Service, our PaaS offering, to make it easier for people that are developers of PHP and Node.js. So a better integration there. Uh, so just some some of the OSS news. Um, again, if you've got any questions on some of this news that I've done, you can reach out to me. Um, there's various other resources. I think we have that on the slides. Um, one thing I do want to point out here is the CNE University. It's a great resource for training. Um, and also reach out to me if you're interested in uh, joining the Cloud Solution Architect Bootcamp, that five-day workshop um, for producing solutions built on Azure and the Microsoft platform. So with that, I will uh, pause and start to talk about and pass it over to Ross on Azure Container Services. To me, the uh, Azure Containers or Containers is a critical piece of technology that I'm seeing multiple partners use to create agility, consistency of when they're deploying solutions. So. I'll hand that over to you, Ross, and uh, handing over to you now. I need to unmute my microphone. Okay, <laughs> um, having done that, I'll proceed. Um, so, um, welcome and, and thank you for spending some time with us here. Um, I'll go straight into things um, and, and give you an idea of what I'm gonna talk about. I'm gonna do a quick demo. Uh, I encourage you to type in questions to Parker, uh, or well, to myself. Uh, Parker will read those questions. He'll interrupt me if there are any that are, are particularly timely, but occasionally I'll pause and give him a chance to also uh, jump in and, and we'll, we'll go through any questions that are in there. So please feel free to ask questions. Um, so um, containers. First of all, everybody talks about Docker at the moment. It's all Docker, Docker, Docker. Um, and Docker is undoubtedly very, very important within the ecosystem as a whole, but containers have been around for a great many years. Uh, something in the region of 15 years that we started doing containerization inside of the Linux kernel. Uh, and there are many production workloads out there that use those low level container technologies. Um, what Docker Inc. did, the company, um, is certainly not invent containers, but what they did do is they created an open source uh, suite of software tools and, a, and an engine and so on that enables us to build and manage those containers without um, the, uh, without understanding the low-level kernel technologies. And so what it meant was is people like me could build and manage containers, and as a result, um, Docker made it very, very easy. Um, and so consequently, um, what we're seeing is a massive uptake uh, of interest in the container ecosystem as a whole. Uh, it's bringing all of those advantages that um, some of the, uh, the more kernel hackery type people have had for a while uh, to, into the reach of um, certainly people like me. Um, and and uh, you know that's saying something. I gave up being an engineer a long time ago, and I gave up being an engineer for good reason. There are much better engineers out there than me. Um, so if it makes me able to do this, it's got to be good uh, for, from that usability perspective. So I am definitely going to talk about containers, and yes, that does mean I'm going to talk about Docker. But it's important to establish that it's bigger than Docker. Um, it's not just Docker. I am going to talk about Docker container images, and I'll explain why I draw that distinction as we go along. But I'm also going to talk about the need for orchestrating containerized applications. I'm going to talk about Azure Container Service. That's my specific interest in, or in and around containers, and, and about 90% of what I'm going to talk about here relates to Azure Container Service. And most importantly, how you as partners can help us and benefit from the work that we're doing uh, through the kinds of programs that Tim was just talking about. And then I'll wrap up talking a little bit about the broader containers on Azure story. 
So um, just to level set, um, there's a large number of people in this uh, in this call, and so I'm sure there's some people out there who don't yet know the 101 advantages of containers. Um, so I'm going to do a very quick demo straight away. Uh, and in this quick demo, uh, I'm going to illustrate that containers are everything that they, that, that they promise to be. If you read the, uh, you know, the high level why you should be interested in containers articles, you'll typically read that you get much faster startup and stop times. You get the much more portable environments. Um, the, because of these two things, you can significantly improve your dev cycle and your ops cycle. And as a result, this whole container ecosystem together makes you much more agile. Um, many people even claim that containers can make dev the promise of DevOps real. Um, and, and you know, I would argue that that certainly is true to a certain extent. Um, there's work to be done. We'll talk about that as we as we move forwards. So I'm just going to share my monitor. So as that's switching over. Uh, I will bring up a browser for the first demo. So this is Azure Container Service, or at least it's one instance of Azure Container Service. We have multiple different types of orchestrator. This particular one is using an orchestrator called um, a DCOS Marathon. Underneath that, it uses a project called Apache Mesos. Uh, and the, infra the, the whole project as a whole come together is a project called DCOS, which is an open source project. Uh, and this is the overview of the uh, of a cluster that I have started. And by cluster, I mean a group of machines on which I'm going to run individual containers. I'm going to come back to that later on. Uh, but for, before I go into what exactly I see on this, I want to switch to this view. And you can see in this view of the container, uh, of sorry, the cluster, I have a bunch of containers start, uh, running here. And this particular one here, this web one, is what I'm looking at. This is actually an application on the left-hand side. This is my application, and this is part of the uh, user interface for managing the cluster in an iframe. Um, so this, is, this part here is part of this dashboard here. In fact, if I go through to here and open it via this path, um, you will see the same view, uh, but in this case, not embedded as a um, not embedded as a uh, as an iframe. So I just want to focus on this one container at the bottom here for now. We're going to come back to this a number of times. But I want to highlight that I have two of these running at the moment. And this is serving, it's a web server working through a proxy. And so you can see my two web servers here. I've clicked through to the view of this particular container. And I have two versions of it. Let me kill both of those versions. Let me just think whether I'm going to be able to recover from this. I've never actually done this demo before. Uh, I will. So I'm going to kill both of these versions, uh, both of these browsers, uh, sorry, web servers. They've gone. Now, if I was to refresh at this point, of course, I would get nothing because there's nothing there. But now I'm back and running again. So I'm going to refresh just to prove that the web server has actually come back up. And uh, it should. There we go. We've refreshed. I did nothing except kill those containers. The orchestrator piece brought them back almost instantly for me. Now, if I left this on long enough, you would notice occasionally that this health bar would occasionally go half red and half green. Uh, and what that what that's hap what is happening there is that every now and again these containers deliberately self destruct. It's programmed into them for demo purposes, and because I'm behind a load balancer, it just continues working. Okay, so that's great. It all happened very fast. It all happened automatically. But why do we care about this kind of functionality? Why do we have all of these other things just to start and stop a web server when we've been doing that in VMs for a very long time? Um, so let's go back to, to the deck. Um, and I need to just go here and here. OK, um, let's talk a little bit about where we are in this container ecosystem and how we get to that kind of thing. And, and, and I will go back to that demo a number of times and, and show you how um, those key features that I brought to, I, I demonstrated there, can make a whole application much more flexible, much more reliable, much more so than you can do with VMs. So this is a, a Gartner hype curve, uh, or at least it's a representation of the Gartner hype curve. 
And we can debate where container technology is on, on this spectrum. I, I would say that the core Linux kernel technologies are somewhere probably around about here. Um, they're definitely being used in production uh, in places like Netflix and Twitter and so on. Um, but uh, you know we're still not all the way up here, and that's largely because it's very hard technology. It's difficult to build things with the core Linux kernel technologies. Docker, on the other hand, and the ecosystem around Docker is probably more about here. Uh, we can debate whether it's down here or just over the peak, but I put it around about here. Um, and so, you know, we've got a big period or potentially a big period of, of disillusionment as we realize that the promise of Docker and containers within the Docker ecosystem are not quite as realistic as, as, as we would like to be, them to be. There is a lot of hype. There's a lot of interest. Now, don't get me wrong. They are extremely powerful. And we will get over to this plateau of productivity. I'm absolutely confident of it. But what we in Azure Container Service want to do and what we want the help of our partners to, to, to achieve is to prevent our customers having to go all the way down into this trough and potentially never come out. We want to build a, a bridge across. And so what we're focusing on is building the infrastructure that allows partners and customers to do precisely this. So how are we doing that? Well, first of all, we've got to look at the open container ecosystem. This is a mind map that's being put together by the community, and it identifies all of the different people in the, eco in, in the container ecosystem who've got parts of this overall solution that will hopefully take us to that plateau. So if I zoom out, you can see there's a fair number of nodes on that, uh, on that uh, uh, mind map. Now, you're not supposed to read it here. There's no need to read it. If you want to, there's a URL at the bottom here. Um, uh, but each one of these nodes is a different technology addressing a different need. So the leaf nodes are technologies and, and companies, and the, um, the, the, the inner nodes here are the problem domain that they're trying to solve. And they're things like storage, network, orchestration, CI, CD, et cetera. And this makes it hugely difficult to build a solution today that is going to prevent you from dropping down into that trough of disillusionment. Which do you pick? Which one is going to be the one for your particular workload? What if you pick the wrong one? How do you, how do you address these, uh, the, these concerns? And that's what Azure Container Service is all about. It's about providing a level of stability that will grow over time and bring us across that plateau, whilst also enabling people to innovate within the ecosystem as a whole. So we start off with Azure. Um, you've probably all heard all of the wonderful things about Azure and why it's the best cloud, et cetera, et cetera. Um, uh, and, and I obviously believe in that, and I think it's great. So that's where we're monetizing. That's how we make our revenue in Azure Container Service, by providing the best infrastructure on which to run your container workloads. A layer above that is the orchestrator. And the orchestrator is what did that thing earlier on. It's what brought my application back to life after I deliberately killed it. It does many more things as well. We'll look at that in a little, in a little while. But we also provide the orchestrator um, that is necessary to uh, build real-world container-based applications and take them for, into production. Uh, we partner heavily in the ecosystem. So two very concrete examples is Mesosphere, who provide, uh, who are part of the DCOS community, and then Docker Swarm uh, is is another piece. And what we do is we optimize the customization of those uh, pieces on top of our infrastructure. We work within the open source communities. We do not do anything that is proprietary. Everything we do is open source. So any optimization we provide is available to you through the open source projects as well. We then provide a, an ARM, an Azure Resource Manager template. Specifically, we have a resource provider, which is container services, that allow you to take the um, thousands of lines of configuration code that are necessary to stand up the orchestrator and the infrastructure and distill it down to just tens of lines of configuration code that you specify. And then we deploy the infrastructure for you. Now, today we deploy it as IaaS. Um, so it's a convenience to get you started and build these things. Moving forwards, as I'll talk about later, we're going to become more of a managed service. But what we are not going to do is go up into the application layer. 
we are not a PaaS service and we have no intention of ever becoming a PaaS service. We are providing the orchestrator, which we believe is, is, is going to be commoditized very rapidly and that there's no real revenue in the long term in that space. Customers don't care what the orchestrator is. They just want the orchestrator to do its job. Customers care about the application. So the orchestrator is a piece of infrastructure. It happens to be an open source piece of infrastructure, which brings massive advantages because if you want to replace this infrastructure with on-prem or your development environment or even another cloud, you can do because it's open source at the top here. But we do not reach up into the application and we do not provide opinionated ways of how you build and manage your applications. But we do provide ways of um, our partners doing that, providing that need. So two examples is Docker Data Center, uh, which is a natural progression from using the Docker Swarm open source components, moving up into Docker Data Center at the, uh, at the application layer. Uh, or um, with DCOS, D Mesosphere have an enterprise edition of DCOS, which you can also use and provides additional functionality on top. I'll come back to that layering later on. But I do want to reiterate the open source piece. Everything we do in Azure Container Service is open source code. We have Windows Server maintain Windows Server com, uh, staff who are a maintainer on Docker, for example. We are a significant part of the DCOS community. We're a significant part of the Apache Mesos community. Any piece that needs customization for Azure, we're in there and working on it. I'm guessing somebody has already asked the question of what about Kubernetes? Um, we are there and active inside of Kubernetes as well. Um, where you can see all the work that we're doing within the Kubernetes ecosystem. When we, the work that we're doing is all geared towards making sure that Kubernetes will run as well on Azure, if not better, our target of course is better, uh, than any other cloud and any other infrastructure. We're very, very close. We recently hired a guy called Brendan Burns, who is uh, one of the original creators of Kubernetes at, at Google. Um, I have nothing officially to share about the future of Kubernetes on Azure, uh, but I will repeat, we just handed, hired one of the founders of Kubernetes. Uh, and um, uh, without giving anything concretely away, I'll point out that it's KubeCon next month in, uh, in Seattle. So uh, watch the press and you, you may be interested in, in the news in that area if you're interested in Kubernetes. Um, so at this point, I'm going to pause just for a moment and ask Parker if we have any questions that I should address before I go into uh, exactly what our approach is with containers. <clears throat> Actually, yeah, Ross, there was a little bit, um, it's just a slight tech issue, but if you go back a few slides, I think it was slide 22, there was a graph. Um, and you were saying here, and I think your mouse was pointing in different places, uh, but they can see it because oh, uh, we're not. Sh if you go back a few slides, yeah, I'm just trying to figure out how to go back. <laughs> <laughs> how do I get it to go back then? Little arrows at the bottom that should help. Oh, maybe it's because I'm not in speak of you. I am in speak of you. Huh. Very strange. Let's try the keyboard. Ah, the keyboard works. <laughs> That's good. So around about 22, there was a graph. Right um, there. Yes. This one. This one okay. right here. And you, you, you were saying here a few times, um, but it was a little bit difficult to see what you were saying here since we can't actually see where your mouse is pointed. Oh, I see. Um, so, so the point here is that we're at the, the peak of the uh, inflated expectations, and we need to move across that dotted line to the plateau of productivity. Uh, and, and we avoid our partners and our customers going down into that trough of disillusionment. Uh, and what that ultimately means in real terms is, as people start to drive Docker into production, uh, or rather I should say containers, this is not unique to Docker tooling, um, uh, containers, they realize that actually this is very early days within the, 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 uh, the, the ecosystem as a whole, and that things like networking and things like storage and so on, things like security, all of these things still need to be addressed. And as people start putting these things out into production, they realize that oh, it's not quite ready yet for many kinds of workloads. 
And that's what happens, that's what the trough of disillusionment is, and many people never actually get out of that trough. So our goal with ACS and with working with our partners who are addressing those specific needs is to bridge across that trough. Perfect. Um, other than that, we do not have any questions, so you can keep moving forward. Okay. Am I forward? Ah, oh, there we go. Okay. So, we were there. Okay, so how containers work? Very, very quickly, um, just really so I can explain what we're doing with Windows Server containers. Um, traditional virtual machines are very heavyweight. They bring an operating system with, with them. I'm sure everybody knows how they work. Uh, in containers, you don't bring an operating system with you. You use the host operating system for the majority of activity, and you actually just bring a very thin layer that allows communication down into the host. And so when we came to do Windows Server containers, we said, well, we could use uh, you know, something that is unique to Windows, or we could recognize the innovation that is happening in the, in what, in the ecosystem Docker was, was really driving forwards, and we could adopt the Docker APIs, the Docker, sta Docker standards, et cetera, and that's what we did. Uh, and so Windows Server containers are no different from Linux containers. Um, you use the same tooling to manage them. You use the same APIs to, to, to write that tooling. The only thing that is different is a Windows Server container can only run on a Windows host, and a Linux container can only run on a Linux host. But other than that, everything else is identical. Uh, the, the, uh, the, the way you build them, the, the Docker files that you use to define them, all of the command line tooling is all the same. Then we also added Hyper-V containers. Now, these are only available for Windows Server containers at this point. Um, but what these are is you start up a very lightweight Hyper-V environment into which you place the same container that you were running if, you, if you're not running in Hyper-V. You place the same container uh, and execute it inside this Hyper-V wrapper. This reduces performance a little bit, not, not massively. We're still talking like sub-second startup times and so on in many cases. Um, but it gives a ha much higher level of isolation. And so it gives us much more opportunity to address the security issues that, uh, that, that um, are exposed in the standard containers. The key point is that they, these containers are the same binary containers whether you run them with the Hyper-V container wrapper or not. So there's no extra steps, it's just a command line switch when you actually start up the container. And the way we did that is we recognized all the technologies in the Linux uh, namespaces, control groups, etc. We worked with Docker to identify how they'd expose this through a consistent API and a consistent set of tooling. We then implemented a similar layer inside of the Windows kernel. And then we rewrote some of the parts of the Docker engine so that they could work against that compute services inside the Windows kernel. Everything else, the APIs, the clients, everything else, is all platform independent. The piece that's platform specific is in the upstream open source project. But in reality, it doesn't matter how you build these things or, or anything, doing what I did earlier on with a single container running a web interface, et cetera, isn't really bringing us the benefits of containers. Real applications consist of multiple containers, multiple instances of each container. You need high availability, you need geographic distribution, you need failover, scalability, and much, much more. So I'm going to skip over these slides here and go straight to this one. Ross, we have a quick question, if you don't mind. Go ahead. Um, one person asks, will we eventually be able to run a Linux Hyper-V container? Possibly. We don't currently have any plans to do that, um, but it is theoretically possible, yes. Um, we're evaluating whether or not there's a real customer need, and I would be very happy to hear feedback from this community as to whether you see a real customer need to do that or not. Given that you um, you don't really care about the host that it's running on, we'll talk about that in just a moment, uh, you only really can care about the applications. And, uh, and given that you uh, use the same tooling to manage it, whether it's Windows or Linux, an argument can be made that it makes no difference where it's running. 
um, and and I, I will make that argument as, as we move forwards. So we're not against the idea necessarily. It is theoretically possible. We're just not convinced that it's worth doing the work. Um, and so I'll, I'll try and answer that more fully as I go through this. So this is a production environment. Um, we've got a single machine where we're, we're managing the deployment of these workloads. Um, and um, in fact, let me go to the next slide because it's, 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 I, I skipped over some. Um, it, it, it has an extra step to it. So um, you have the orchestrator piece at the top, Docker Swarm or DCOS, and you make your request against the orchestrator. You don't worry about where these containers are going to run. You don't worry about what virtual machines are available and where the resources are available. You simply say, run my applications on this infrastructure. Uh, and it deploys the containers for us. And so to the question about Linux on Win uh, as a Hyper-V uh, container, <clears throat> Hyper-V runs on Windows, which means that you need Linux on top of Windows, uh, a Linux running in Hyper-V on Windows. There are other solutions that have copied what we've done using Hyper-V that allows, <clears throat> excuse me, that allows the same kind of um, isolation through virtualization. <clears throat> With um, uh, with Linux, uh, and so you, the, the question was specifically Hyper-V. I do see a use case for having the increased isolation, but it's not necessarily Hyper-V that needs to provide that isolation. It might be better to remove the extra layer of complexity of running on top of Windows and have it running on Linux itself. Um, so this is what an orchestrator does. It worries about where it should run, Linux on Linux, Windows on Windows where the resource is available, whether the containers are actually running, et cetera. And so um, at this point, um, I want to just jump into the demo again and show you what that looks like with a real production workload rather than just the, um, uh, the simple web container that we looked at a moment ago. So I'll switch back to my, uh, my, my browser here. And this time, I'm going to show you the whole application. So if you think of this application as being um, any kind of bursty workload, uh, so it could be an e-commerce site which is receiving orders and occasionally has big blips when there's, a, I don't know, a Super Bowl advert or something. Or it might be processing images that are coming in and when there's a big public event and there's many more images coming in. Or it might be anything, anything that's bursty. But you also have a lower priority batch job that is processing those things that's not time dependent. So let's continue with the e-commerce example and look through each of these containers. So the analyzer container at the top is, um, uh, is the one that's doing the bursty workload. It's analyzing the, uh, the order. We said we'll stick with the e-commerce one. So an order comes in, the analyzer grabs the order from a queue and it says, is the email address valid? Is the credit card valid? Do we have stock in, et cetera? And then it tells the system to respond back to the customer. You obviously want this to happen very, very quickly because a customer is trying to give you money. If it's image processing, same thing. You might want to do a, a, a face recognition thing very, very quickly um, and, and get the answer back very quickly. The auto scale container is going to worry about whether or not we're working within the SLA, and we'll come back to that. The batch is the low priority job. So in e-commerce, it might be doing uh, big data processing of past orders and looking for patterns in past orders in order to manage uh, future recommendations or future order uh, from, from suppliers, that kind of thing. The producer container is just going to simulate workload for me in a moment. The rest query is part of the back end, so all of these other systems query the status of the, uh, the queue via the REST query. And the queue is where the work goes. So when the producer starts up, it will push things into a queue. In this case, it's pushing it into an Azure queue, but it could be in a, a queue that was in a container within this ecosystem. I've chosen to do it in an Azure queue for performance reasons, but you can have portability and do it within, uh, in, within here too. And then the web we talked about earlier on, it's what we're looking at right now. On the left-hand side, you see queue length, which is the current length of the queue. So there's nothing. There's no work coming in. And you see um, processing time. Uh, and processing time is the time it took to process the last item we sampled in the queue. And the graph below, the orange line, is the processing time. The blue line is the queue. 
So I'm going to start up two versions of two instances of the producer. This is going to simulate approximately 2,000 queries a second going into the queue or workloads per second going into the queue. So there we go. We see the queue is, is going up. Now, I forgot to show, look quickly over here at the batch. It says five of five. I'll come back to why that's important in a moment. So the queue length is going up, and we're taking at the moment around 11 seconds to respond to customers. That's not good. This 2,000 queries a, a, a orders a second, we're not within SLA of, let's say, around one and a half seconds. Oh, but what's going on? It's starting to go down, and I've not done anything here. We're already coming down, and we're getting down to four seconds, and now we're within SLA, and that took just a few seconds. So if we look back over here on the right, we can see what happened. The batch job has gone down to one job instead of the five that it was earlier. It's just trying to start up a new one. It'll find it doesn't have enough resources, and it will go back to one of one. There you go. The analyzer has gone from one, which is what it was originally. I forgot to point that out, um, to 29. So what's happened is the autoscaler has scaled down the batch in order to make space for the analyzers to respond to the work that we had. Now, I'm just going to kill those producers so there's no work going in again. And whilst that's taking effect, I'm just going to go back to the dashboard. Look at our CPU usage. It's pretty much constant. You can see where we've been. Here is where we killed off a batch job. And then we started up the remainder of the, uh, the analyzers. And we're at 69% usage across a cluster of eight nodes. So all of these containers are running across eight different nodes. And our orchestrator, we've actually got higher usage now, 75%. I'll show you why that is in a moment. But we're, we, we don't have to do anything. Our orchestrator is worrying about everything in our ecosystem for us. So here we can see that because I killed the producer, there's no work going into the queue anymore. So we're scaling down on the analyzer. It scales down much more slowly than it scales up because you know we don't know when extra work's going to come. It wants to do it gradually, but you scale up as fast as you possibly can. As it scales down, more resources become available in the cluster, and so the batch job scales up. We're already at two, and that's why you saw that spike when we were looking at the graph up to 75%. The batch jobs take more CPU than the analyzers do, and so consequently, it uh, quickly fired up. So we, you see it keeps trying to scale up. And once it has enough resources available, it will do. So I'm just going to accelerate the scale down and tell it to just scale down to one analyzer. Uh, that error is just telling me I'm already in the middle of a deployment. Do you really want to override this? So I did. Um, in about 10 seconds, all of these will have closed down. They do a graceful shutdown. And once they've closed down, the batch job will scale back up again. I'll just give it a moment to do that. OK, um, we're up to four. And five is the most it can run. And so in just a few seconds, there you go, five of five. And if I go back to my uh, uh, graph, it'll, there you go, it's updated. So you can see it gradually scaling down here. And then it scales up because a batch job started gradually scaling down. This is where I force killed them all, and then we got two batch jobs started. And we're at 81% utilization. We never went below 63% utilization during that whole experiment. I want to do one more thing before I move back to the deck. I'm going to restart the, the producers. And same thing will happen, except that I didn't actually uh, restart them. Oh, I did. OK, good. So same thing will happen. We'll see a spike in the queue. There we go. I'm going to wait till it starts coming down. Actually, I'm going to, I'm going to come back to this. I'm just going to, going to go back to my deck. I'm going to come back to this in a moment. I want it to get up to having the full, um, full complement of um, analyzers working before I can do my next part of the demo. So let me just go back to the deck. Uh, and save that few seconds of, of waiting for it to get back to that status.
So that's an example of the kind of thing that you can do with a, a, a fully configured, fully optimized orchestrator. That particular demo, I didn't link into the scalability of the underlying infrastructure. Um, I could easily do that. The auto scale component that I had in there could easily say, if I'm waiting for analyzer resources, start me a new VM. And then that way, you're actually scaling up and down your infrastructure as well as your containers. In the demo I did there, I wasn't. It takes a few uh, minutes to start up a new VM, so uh, it's more difficult to do that kind of demo, but it's entirely possible. Um, so we've already seen this slide, so I shall skip over that one. Uh, very briefly, um, what you deploy when you deploy Azure Container Service, you deploy the masters. That's where the orchestrator lives. That's where all the main software lives. That's what we were looking at in the black screens. You have a public agent pool, which is where the um, load balancers are in the application I had there. So that's where the load balancers are. And then in, you have a private agent pool. And this is where all of the other workloads were being run, including the web and the REST APIs, because they were exposed to the outside through load balancers that are built as containers. The reason I build them as containers is to make the whole application portable. I want to be able to run the same application on my laptop that I develop on that I run in production. I could choose to use the Azure load balancer to balance across public agents like web servers in here. I don't do that because I'm then dependent on the Azure load balancer for a function of my application. And so I actually use a load balancer that is in a container so that I can then uh, do the same uh, tests that I, would do, uh, uh, that I would do in my test environment in the cloud or in my production environment. I can do the same tests in my development environment as well. Um, so not everything is a Docker container. I started off saying Docker's made it really popular, but there's a lot of technology out there that actually uses the lower level container technologies. One example of this is the SMAC stack, uh, Apache Spark, Apache Mesos, Akka, Apache Cassandra, and Apache Kafka. These have been around for longer than Docker has been around and have been um, using container technologies since their inception. One of the other advantages of DCOS is that that's where DCOS came from. It came from the uh, the Docker eco uh, sorry the um, container ecosystem where things like Spark and, and Kafka and all the things we we just mentioned it. So Docker is, uh, sorry DCOS is able to run these as well as Docker containers. So the example like the demo I just gave was all Docker containers, but you can also run large scale Cassandra workloads in DCOS. And so many people say, what's the difference between um, Docker Swarm moving on to Docker Data Center? What's the difference between DCOS uh, versus Docker Swarm? What's the difference with Kubernetes? I would say, if you are running purely Docker workloads and you want the end-to-end -end Docker story, then Docker Swarm is a great choice um, because it's Docker native end-to-end. -end. But it's the least mature, at least where orchestrators are concerned, it's the least mature. And so what scale do you want to run at? Do you want to be at the cutting edge of running at that scale or not? DCOS, on the other hand, is built on Apache Mesos. It is not Docker native. It will run Docker containers for you, but it's more container native than Docker native. And as a result, the Docker ecosystem, it, it lags a little bit behind the Docker ecosystem in terms of its adoption of the latest advances in the Docker ecosystem. But the payoff there is that there are, no, there are clusters being managed by Mesos that are in the, the you know, five digits. I know of a cluster that's 65,000 nodes. Um, it's actually multiple clusters brought together and managed together. Um, but it's, it, it's 65,000 nodes is a massive, massive scale. And it's proven in production at that scale. And then in between the two, you have Kubernetes. Kubernetes is, is, is uh, newer. It's grown up in the Docker ecosystem. Um, it's not Docker native, but it's also um, optimized for Docker as opposed to optimized for the lower level technologies. And so the difference there is uh, it's not quite as easy to get into as Docker and Docker Swarm, Docker Data Center, but it's nowhere near as hard as um, DCOS and Mesos. But it's not proven in production just as Swarm isn't, but DCOS is. Those are the key differences, and there is no obvious winner between the three if we look further out to the future. 
And so I do want to skip forward because these last couple of slides um, I definitely want to get to. And then if I have enough time, I'll go to my final demo, which is a, a, a resilience demo. Um, so I talked earlier on about how um, we, we provide the infrastructure and we optimize the orchestrator. I also hinted that we're going to go more towards managed services. And what I mean by managed services is that today we just provide the infrastructure and the orchestrators as IaaS. We don't do managed upgrades and things like that. So we're not really a service yet. But we do need to bring that. We do need to manage that software. Our goal is to build an absolutely rock solid platform for running containerized applications. Our goal is also to work with our partners to make sure that those applications can be built. And today, there is no opinionated way of how to build applications, not for Azure Container Service. We don't have any opinion about the way you build your application. But we do recognize the need to have opinions about how you would build a retail application, or how you build a gaming application, or how you build a finance application. And when you become opinionated about these things, you can optimize for that environment. So where we are optimizing for the orchestration of containers on Azure, we're looking to our partner ecosystem, as well as first party services as in, in some areas like IoT, we have a first party service. But we're looking to our partner ecosystem to work with us and build these verticals on top that allow people to go faster building their applications in specific domain environments. And we're, we're there, we're ready to do that. Um, this is not yet public, um, but it will be next month. Um, this is We're open sourcing the engine that we use to build and configure that Azure Container Service. And the reason we're open sourcing it is so that people like yourselves, who are right at the edge of what the container technology can do today, can experiment with us, with our engineers, etc., in the true open source fashion and so on. So this is, it's not open source right now because we're still going through the final legal review, but it, it, it's, we're close to the end and I predict that we will be open sourcing it next month. So I uh, absolutely welcome every uh, one of you to that ecosystem and help us figure out exactly what this should look like moving forwards. Just very last thing. Um, uh, is the uh, is this example of Esri? There's a full video online. You can see the link at the bottom. Um, but Esri have done precisely that. They have built a, a PaaS-like solution for GIS services in real time on top of the IoT uh, uh, offering that we have, which in turn is on top of ACS. And the key point is, they have reduced building a proof of concept from weeks to days. Of course, that makes happier customers for them, which makes happier customers for us, which means that we're happy with our Azure infrastructure and charging at that layer. Our partner is happy, our customers are happy, and hopefully everybody continues to be happy. So this is what we want to reproduce as many times as possible in as many of those vertical environments that we can possibly help with. I'm not going to go to the final demo because we're at the very top of the hour. Um, the final demo, I was simply going to kill off all of the analyzers, just like I killed the web um, uh, container before, and you would, it would come back fast enough that you wouldn't even see a blip in the graph uh, of, the, of the workload. Uh, but the final closing point is Docker is important and containers are important to Azure as a whole. So you're not only seeing them in Azure Container Service, you're also seeing them as being the kind of execution unit of choice for Azure as a whole. So they're in batch, they're in uh, web, uh, web services, and they're coming to more and more of our application services as we move forward. So thank you very much. Uh, we'll let you know when we've open sourced that, that, that uh, ACS engine, uh, and we look forward to working with you on what the future of the Azure Container Service is uh, as we uh, move along this hype, so hype curve together. Awesome, I pre appreciate it, Ross. Um, just to let everybody know, we did have quite a few questions. I'll be post posting them on the Yammer site and the answers there. So if you've got any more questions, continue the conversation on the Yammer site. And um, hopefully I'll see you next month when we're going to dig deep on open source and the data platform. 
I appreciate your time. Thanks, everybody, and thank you very much, Ross, and some exciting news there that you, on our open sourcing of ACS. So I appreciate it. Thank you.